6. Sin as personal fulfilment. No little attention has been given in the 20th century to the matter of being a real person. A variety of psychological cults have devoted themselves to this supposed problem. The individual in the 20th century is supposedly in quest of personhood and is, quote, finding, end quote, himself out of the morass of religion, morality, superstition and the like. All of this is, of course, radically anti-Christian. What it called for is the development of a, quote, free personality, end quote, that is, an individual who makes his own decisions as an autonomous, creative and ultimate individual. Ego building is basic to all such cults. In fact, it has become routine to define delinquent and criminal actions by persons young and old as a, quote, cry for help, end quote, from a wounded ego. In terms of this, we are asked to view the delinquent, the homosexual, the murderer and other offenders as, first of all, social victims whose egos need self-confidence and greater freedom. Their offences are held to be an attempt to strike back at barriers. Thus, sin is converted into sickness and the criminal offender into a victim. The uniqueness of the individual is seen as his supposed ultimacy. Anything which limits or frustrates the self-realization of the unique person is held to be wrong. According to scripture, however, man, instead of being an independent being, is totally dependent upon God. At every point of his life and being, and in every atom and moment thereof, Man is totally dependent upon God. No declaration of independence by man can ever dissolve any aspect of that dependence. Man's sin and unbelief do not remove his dependence upon God. Rather, his relationship is merely changed from grace to judgment. The uniqueness of man is not himself. It is in his relationship to God as his image-bearer and covenant creature. Man's sin is to pretend to be a God, his own God, determining good and evil for himself. Genesis chapter 3 verse 5 This claim to be God means also the claim to infallibility. This is rarely openly stated, but it is no less true. Berger has noted, the broad tradition of liberal ideology, all the way back to the Enlightenment, has an especially close relationship to the process of modernization. Indeed, the argument can be made that this tradition embodies the myth of modernity more than any other. It is not surprising, then, that it has been singularly blind to the importance and, at times, even the very existence of mediating structures. Liberalism is, above all, a faith in rationality. Its designs for society are highly rational, abstract, universalistic. The ultimate test of all things is, in this perspective, reason. Reason may, in process, often prove fallible, but the ultimate judge over all things is held to be reason, so that... While a deferred infallibility is, quote, modestly, end quote, maintained, reason replaces God. With others, the scientific method becomes man's potentially infallible tool for the exercise of his authority and ultimacy. Even when humanism, in its Freudian disintegration, assails man, it still retains ultimacy for him. Freud denied the validity of reason, by seeing it as a facade for the unconscious. However, he transferred infallibility in a more rigorous form from man's reason to man's unconscious. The unconscious became, for Freud, a wellspring of infallible knowledge concerning man as an individual, concerning man's primordial history and concerning man's present life. 
the modern state, not only in the earlier doctrine of the divine right of kings, but even more in democratic theory, in Marxism and in fascism, asserts its own ultimacy and infallibility. In one form or another, we have the ancient pagan doctrine. Vox populi, vox dei. The voice of the people is the voice of God. The state declares itself to be that voice. Today, of course, we are seeing the disintegration of that humanism. Drucker sees present events as possibly foreshadowing the end of the age of the infallible society. At any rate, this presumption and sin is still very much a part of our world. The modern quest for personhood is thus a quest for sin. It is the attempt to supplant God's ultimacy with man's. In the process, God is often retained to some degree. In paganism, as well as in some forms of church faith, God becomes, rather than the Lord and creator of all things, an actual experience. The power in the experience leads to endowment with form. This is the perspective of phenomenology. In such a perspective, God is a resource for man, and not Lord, and to regard God as a resource is sin, for it is an assumption of sovereignty on our part. All too often, however, the motivating force in religion is based on this presupposition of personal sovereignty. Men then go to religion and God to fill a personal need. Like food and water, God becomes a resource to meet and serve human wants. Personal fulfillment is stressed as an important religious motivation. All this, however, is in radical contradiction to biblical faith. We do not approach God to fulfill our needs, but to be commanded and used for his kingdom and glory. It is not the chief end of God to glorify man and to enjoy him forever, but rather the reverse. The Westminster Larger Catechism declares, Man's chief and highest end is to glorify God and fully to enjoy him forever. Paul declares, For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Romans chapter 11, verse 36. The cult of personality, however, reduces God from sovereignty to an experience and a resource. Such a faith colours all life and reality. The function of God and the world, then, is to provide us with the stage, our appointed scenario, and the required props for us to fulfil ourselves. But the fulfilment of man is the social ideal of the fall, and it only aggravates and extends the scope of the fall further into history. Personal fulfilment as a personal and social goal converts sin into a virtue and ensures social disintegration. The proliferation of crime and discontent is related to the cult of being a real person, because this cult requires the conscious and religious practice of sin, that is, playing at being God, as a religious act. The emphasis in life is then on the individual, the person. Marriage then becomes expendable if it is held to conflict with personal fulfilment. As Stern has noted, marriage, once the foundation of society, has been sacrificed by many in favour of new definitions of personal pleasure. The goal is intimacy without vulnerability, love without commitment or responsibility. Men seek rebirth without cost, and adults crawl into big cribs to play at being reborn. The cult of personality creates a people who are the takers of the world, not the doers. As a result, their defeat is sure. 
We are told by our Lord that it is the meek who are blessed and who shall inherit the earth. Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. The word meek, prows, means gentled, tamed, broken to harness and humble. The word cannot be read humanistically. Meekness is in relationship to God as Lord. Because the blessed meek are faithful and obedient to God and his word, they are heirs of the earth in and under him. The reverse of, or antonym to, meek is sinful, and a lot of the sinner is disinheritance. What they have shall be taken from them. Matthew chapter 13 verse 12. The cult of personality thus leads to the destruction of man. By its atomism, it isolates man from God and society, works to dissolve marriage and other relationships, and to exalt man as his own religious goal. The consequence of sin is always death.